that Ryan can hear uh, today. Uh, I first want to thank Ginger and Judy uh, for the wonderful exhibition upstairs that we started talking about two and a half years ago. Uh, it's been great. The show is really, really beautiful, as you can see. And uh, I'm really happy with it. The people who come in are really excited about it. Um, the phrase that I've started using uh, recently to describe what we do here at the Berman is that we work really hard at making people feel uh, comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, so this show has helped us in that mission of, of doing that because we know a lot of what we do uh, for a lot of people is you know, uh, different. So uh, I'm not going to waffle on like I usually do because I'm, some of my staff complain that I, I just sort of just talk and sort of meaningless chatter and stuff that you know, <laughs> there's a lot of hums and whatever. And I'm also, uh, um, if you want to find out about Deborah and Ken, do what most young people do now. They just go to the web and they Google them. So I don't need to repeat all that great stuff about these two people. Um, his name is Ken, her name is Deborah. Uh, they're both really smart and really nice. Um, I don't know Ken. I do know uh, that he's a little tired, uh, but I know Deborah really, really well, and um, she's she's great, um, and he's he's okay. So. So how's that for a new and different introduction? Isn't that better than the usual one when they're reading all, you know? I mean, Deborah has a Nobel Prize, you know, Ken, you know, won the Pulitzer Prize, but you know, you need to know all that. So anyway, enjoy, enjoy the discussion. Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy, I get those two confused. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. There is some overlap from this morning's session, but there are some people that weren't able to be with us this morning, so there may be a little bit of overlap in introducing um, Ken's work in terms of our conversation. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it in, uh, or spend some time in front of it, um, what you'll hear today will compel you to go upstairs and spend a little time with it once we're done here. Um, so I wanted to ask you to begin with to talk about your relationship um, as it pertains to the idea of, um, well your work has to do with, with the, the works upstairs have to do with space mm -hmm. and your relationship to outer space culturally, generationally, how it is that you came to, at least in this body of work, deal with space in the ways that you have? Yeah. There, there's a bunch of different ways that I, I started on that. And um, you know, one thing I didn't tell you about, we, we prepped, we actually talked before this. Um, and uh, I, I remember back in graduate school, we were just, me and other students, we were just feeling so hammered. You know, that all the like professors hated whatever we did, or at least seemed like they did. And we were just like getting beat up, and and I remember joking about like how could we beat the professors? Like, what could you do? Like how could you make a work of art that would be just so awesome that nobody was going to mess you up over it? And we started thinking about things we liked from childhood, and we we came up with uh, the Star Wars movie, The Empire Strikes Back, and that's the one with the snowy planet. It's called the Ice Planet Hoth. We all decided if you had the Ice Planet Hoth in your artwork, no one would say anything bad about it. I'm like, it's got the ice planet off in your artwork. And it was just like a joke, a drunken conversation we're having. Um, and somehow I then started making work about outer space. And I, I think part of it was thinking of that conversation, but part of it was maybe just a goof on, you know, it was really cool. This is back in the 1990s, long ago. You know, you're like, oh, I'm really interested in space, you know, architectural space or you know, this kind of space. And I was like, I'm really into space. You know, outer space. Um, and literally, like, people would have that conversation, what Ken's work about these days? Space, you know, outer space, outer space, outer, yeah, outer space, or like, I had a studio visit with a gallerist once, he's like, what am I gonna do, tell people you're into outer space? I'm like, yeah! <laughs> like, it just seemed something you weren't supposed to do. It was so uncool, and so, like, not the right topic. Um, and so I really liked that um, as one of my entry points into it. 
And I, but I, I, I do think other than being like a smart ass, you know, 20 something at the time that in my, my upbringing, the thing I looked to the most was science fiction. Like I was like a nerd in it. And um, one of my earliest memories of like wanting to have something to do with the arts in any way was seeing a uh, program, I guess you'd call it a documentary when I was little, maybe in third or fourth grade or something, about how special effects were made. And that they were talking about the stars in the background of like 2001 Space Odyssey or the old Star Trek shows um, or any space movie were more often than not pieces of black construction paper with holes punched in it and a light shining behind it. And as a kid, I was like, what? Like, that's the infinite. Like, that's where all the cool stuff happens. And like, I could do that here in my bedroom with like my craft supplies that I have. That's so amazing. Um, and like something clicked there, and like, yeah. like at that moment, I was like, I want to. I think I, I wanted to go make Star Wars movies or space movies. So I was like, that's so cool. And I remember, uh, I mean, this is like, I hate it when artists talk about. It. When I was a little kid, this is what got me into art. But this question just brings it up. The earliest photographs I, I remember making was after that, going and getting my little Star Wars toys and trying to set them up in the snow to make it look like the Star Wars. Planet, huh? The ice planet off. <laughs> it all comes back to the ice planet off. <laughs> So that's where that all started. Um, I don't know, with this body of work, it's, it was like harkening, harkening back to it, I guess, like still thinking about space. And between the earliest piece up there was 2002, and uh, I probably had left space behind for a little bit until I, until I settled on that. And, um, and I think the, <clears throat> the space thing, with that, that piece, the one that's called, uh, it might look good this way too, I think the, the thing I was thinking about more than space at that moment was like construction and destruction, and like how you make something versus how you destroy something. And, uh, and I made a, a piece a couple of years before that that was, um, it was a video of uh, my hands, and you know this video, um, trying to put together these little models of people, these little like uh, railroad scale models of people that I, I had bought thinking that they were fully assembled and when I opened it up they were in parts. You know, the arms were separate and the legs and the head. And you had to glue it together and uh, I didn't know what to do with it. And I tried to make one and it was really difficult to, to assemble and I thought that was a sort of interesting moment of thinking about like how to put something together. And they're all white, you know, they look like, like Greek sculpture, like Greek, Greek statues. And so I just made this video of trying to assemble them and, and, and I was thinking, about the act of creation, like how you build it, and and uh, and then a couple of years later, it's like what you know what happens after the act of creation, and I was like, oh, maybe it's the act of destruction that happens. And uh, I had this stuff that I was talking about this morning called Mirror Flake in my studio. That was this really cool glitter, and I was like, oh, you know, this could look like stars. And um, what if stars? You know, what if what if the act of destruction or creation is the disappearance, the erasure of everything, like removing stuff and. Um, it's like, how do I get it off? You know, how do I do that? And, uh, and again, maybe maybe it came back to that documentary about special effects that I saw. Because another thing that was interesting in that that I remember is they were showing how they make the laser gun sounds in, in movies. And um, they were like, oh, they had sound artists go around and, and investigate sounds. And how they settled on the ones for Star Wars or something was, you know, the guy would experiment with all this stuff. And what he wound up doing was going, you know, like the big electrical poles that have like wires that, that fasten them down. Like he, he hit one with a wrench, you know, like, Bow! or something like that sound. And that was the sound they decided to use for the laser guns. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was thinking about how this, you know, again, a very common thing become, changes or something. And, um, and so somehow I, I decided that the vacuum sounded like some kind of inner space, like a spaceship or, or like I say, the stairs like Andy Yang you know, talks about the sound of the, the cosmos and maybe that like that white noise is the sound of the cosmos itself or something. Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be a kind of continuum between the very low tech mm -hmm. and the high tech in your work. Yeah. Um, and your um, conjuring up this idea of special effects also seems 
to sort of ride that kind of continuum. You mentioned um, Star early, the first um, Star Trek um, series, and my my exposure to that was when I was cocktail waitressing, and I would get home at three in the morning, and I would be so um, wired from working that I would watch, it would be an all night Star Trek first season marathon se session. Mm -hmm. um, it would go, you know, till seven in the morning and I would be stand, you know, watching back to back episodes. And there is something so sort of delightfully low tech about the appearance of that, especially compared to um, the kind of computer generated, um, um, special effects that we're, that we're accustomed to now, and you're sort, you sort of seem to be playing with that kind of continuum in your work. Yeah, and I think what I like about that, that low tech is sort of what I like about art in general, and that, um, you know, I, I, I like science fiction movies, and, you know, I like going and seeing super high tech spectacle and stuff, but I don't, like, when I, when I go to look at art, I want something different, I would say, and I, and, one of the things I want to do is I want to understand it. You know, if you think of the Wizard of Oz, you know, like pulling the man behind the curtain. Like with art, I like seeing the person behind the curtain, like seeing how this thing was made, understanding it to be like real, to be you know, like I could reach out and touch it. I, I get it how it was constructed. Whereas like the the spectacle and the myth of, of like science fiction movies, like I, I want to just suspend disbelief and not really even think about how it was made. I just want to be immersed in that. But for art, like I, I want it to be tangible. And this thing that I get. I got once acute, like, I mean, it, I've been told it's been a problem with my work, too, that, like, I always want to show the person behind the curtain. And some people, sometimes people don't want to see that and, like, let the, you know, let, let an illusion happen or something. And uh, I, I, maybe back, right, right when I was making that first piece was sort of um, right when the, the Matthew Barney Craymaster series was reaching its completion or thing, and there was this big show at the the Guggenheim of the Craymaster series, and you could watch the films and go see the props that he made, and then they weren't really the props, they were like heightened versions of the props so that they could be sold as sculptures. Um, and I remember seeing someone was like, I was so pissed. I was like, I hate these movies. Um, they're too slick, you know? And this show, like out in San Francisco at the same time at the Yerba Buena Center for the Art, there's a show called The Art of Star Wars. And I was like, this is as dumb as the art of Star Wars, or as great as the art of Star Wars, like whichever way you want to go, there's no difference here. And like, I turned to both of these for different reasons, and like, um, I think that really propelled me. It's like, I'm gonna make stuff that is like not slick on that, um, you know, that does show exactly how it was made. And I'm like, if I'm gonna, if I was ever gonna have a show like the art of Star Wars in my own work, it was like, you see the stupid vacuum cleaner that I use, not like a sculpture version of the vacuum cleaner, it would be the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Um, I want to turn to the, the Colored Space Rock series that you did. There's, I think, nine, perhaps, of them upstairs, yeah. something like that. Um, and for those people that weren't in the earlier session today, if you could talk first a little bit about how you, con how you constructed those photographs. Um, because it seems to me that your work set has um, says a lot about the history of photography mm -hmm. in certain respects. And also, they seem to be speaking in a kind of vocabulary of studio portraiture, which is also a sort of highly constructed way of making an image, this kind of central focus. And you, you talked about playing with the lighting. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you could talk about that a little as well. Yeah. I mean, it's. I like all those analogies, and uh, I, I guess most of my training is in photography. Like I, when I was in undergraduate college, I wasn't a major in photography, but that's all I did was photography. And, um, of the mediums I work with, it's the one I probably understand the history of and how it works the most and how different things uh, mean the most. And uh, I always, and, I, and, I, and in some ways I'm a student of photo history partially because I teach photo history. I'm not a photo historian, but like one of the things I, I've taken on is, is doing that. And um, in my thinking about it, like I'm often thinking about how it's all constructed, not just studio, but that it's, that it's all this kind of like 
thing being put forward that we, practitioners of it, tricked people 180 years ago now or something, um, that it was real. But it was all like a trick from the get-go, that it, that it was real. It was all highly, highly constructed. You know, from the point that it's like a monocular point of view, uh, early photographs, like, um, you know, we think of the, the what is it, Boulevard, the Daguerre, the Boulevard, Vol Voltaire, no, Boulevard. There's a Paris street, one of these first photographs, I can't remember the name right now, and it looks empty. And it em looks empty because it's a 10 minute long exposure. So there, it's not real, quote, it's 10 minutes long that it, that it, uh, you know, it takes. And it's also inverted because the way old cameras work, they didn't have a reflex that was correcting the, the image. And so it was an inverted image of this thing. And it's black and white, which isn't how it really looked anyways. Um, like all these things are like added to construct. And, and I was thinking about like going past that, the first color photographs are multiple exposures, right? a, a red, a green, and a blue exposure so that you can and combine them later. And they weren't even prints. They, like the first color photos had to be projections. You had to show them through a lantern slide. So it was just an ephemeral thing on the wall, an image. Um, you know, when you say the word multiple exposure, that's something that's associated with special effects or trickery, um, something that's not real. And if you fast forward that to today, like that's how NASA images are made. They're multiple exposures. Anything you see from the Hubble, like the Hubble doesn't sit still, it orbits space and it doesn't it needs a lot of time to expose for the low levels of light that are coming at it so they're all multiple exposures like they might go back to that exact place in space and take the picture again but it, it's taking it over and over again so they're they're constructs in the same way and uh it's always i wanted to start playing with this idea of like the multiple exposure in the real um the constructed portrait versus a thing, and uh, and I and I found these rocks that were just bright white, and I was really attracted to this bright white glittery rocks, and uh, and I brought them into my studio, and you know they're they're like pumpkin size, maybe a little bit bigger or something. I know pumpkins can be really big, <laughs> so they're like medium sized pumpkins. Or um, I'm in such an auto mood, <laughs> uh, and and I was I was thinking about all these things that I just went off about and. I came up with this idea of lighting them in, for three exposures, a red exposure, green exposure, blue exposure, but lighting them from different spots each time. And, and uh, so I had, uh, I had like one handheld flash and a bunch of colored gels, and I put a red gel on and took an exposure over here. And then I went over here and took a green exposure and then maybe went behind it um, and took the, the blue exposure and just did that for the three different rocks over and over and over again. So I had, you know, a whole bunch of red exposures, a whole bunch of green exposures, a whole bunch of blue exposures. And then kind of willy-nilly, I would just you know, lay them on top of each other and to get a, a full color image, a red, green, blue image. But because the, they were all made at separate points, the registration is not quite right. And you have this kind of, if you go up close, you can see parts where it blurs out or the channels are separated a tiny bit, stuff like that. Um, all in this attempt to create you know, perfect white, I guess, in the end, like to get the, the white that, that they saw. Do you consider them portraits of the rocks? Um, yes and no. There, <laughs> it's funny. There's, uh, there's another series. So those are all like the single ones. And then I think you looked on my website and saw the stacked ones. And there's another series where the, all three rocks are stacked on top of each other. And then there's one image that I, I never released to the public. Um, so I'm from Chicago originally. And these were being made in uh, 2016, I think, or 2015, whenever. Like, right when the Cubs started getting good. And um, there's a picture I have of a stack of three of them with my Cubs hat on. And it, it's called Self-Portrait as a Rock. <laughs> but I never, I never, it's a secret one. If anybody wants to see it, just let me know. Direct message me. <laughs> so your work is like a, a lot of art today and a lot of art historically very much indebted to science. Um, we're on a liberal arts college campus. You teach at a liberal arts college. Um, our students are versed in science as well as art. Um, could you talk a little bit about that kind of approach, both as an artist and as an educator? Yeah. Yeah, and maybe, maybe photography is one of these perfect mediums to 
to talk about that and where it goes. So the way I, I, I teach a studio photography class as well as a history photography class, among other things, and, um, and I teach it with, in a humanities department. I don't teach in an art department. Um, and I, I make it really clear to the students that from the get-go, photography is something that came out of science and industry. It was not invented as a It was invented to copy your notes. You know, like it was invented for practical reasons. And then the inventors worked really hard to get credit for it as art by giving it names like the pencil of nature, photogenic drawing, you know, using the word drawn, using the word pencil to get it associated with artistic practices because they felt like, well, it was a business decision, like that was another way they could sell this thing. Um, but it's, it's one of these things that can be understood and talked about from scientific perspective. In fact, at the school I teach, there's the physics department also teaches a photography class, and it's very different than my photography class, because it's a, a medium then that can be used for art. And then, inevitably though, you can't, you can't always separate it. You know, although the physicists always say, we're not, here, we're not gonna teach them how to take a good picture, whatever that, we're gonna just teach them how it works. I'm like, you can't, you can't do one without the other. Just like I can't only teach them about the ideas and the, the theory and history of it, um, and then also how to use it to you know, make something you want to make as art without talking about the technical side of it. Without talking about how those three colors, right, gray and blue equal white, and like, you know, what, what color balance is. Without talking about you know, exposures. Without talking about even the evolution of the technology. The medium. Um, and you know, each of those technological changes made new things happen. And even as a medium, it presents so many awesomely confounding problems. Like, like Carol Edgerton, the, the MIT engineer who invented high-speed photography, you know, most famous for like the, the bullet going through the apple, you know, which isn't like not a literary reference. I don't really know like, what it is. But um, you know, he, he famously said, don't call me an artist. I'm an engineer. That should answer, okay, these aren't art, right? Like, these photographs aren't art, because he said, I'm not an artist. And uh, yet, like, the most recent place I saw them was, I think it was at the Hirshhorn, and it was a, a, a show about destruction and art. And there was a, a bunch of his photographs of atomic bomb explosions that he had been hired by the Army to photograph that he developed a lot of technology for. And so, like, and, and they looked beautiful and gorgeous, these atomic bomb explosions. And, incredibly perfect in the context of this exhibition. But, you know, right there is something that, like, you need then suddenly to stop talking about them as science and start talking about them in more, my department is called Humanities, Social Sciences, and the Arts. And, like, and as soon as those photographs show up at the Hirshhorn, like, they're game for, for that discussion rather than, like, how are these made? I wonder, too, about the focus on space and outer space um, in the show more generally, in your work, at a moment when there's a lot of discussion um, culturally about the peril that our own planet faces. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you, if you think about that when you're working or if that is somehow related to this trajectory in your work. Mm -hmm. I've been asked a couple of times about my relationship with environmentalism, and I, I, I don't have an answer in terms of my practice of, of making art. Like, I'm not sitting there, you know, consciously thinking about that shift. Um, and uh, it's interesting, though, like, the, the piece upstairs with the trash, the, the simulated trash, um, you know, I, I, and then you're describing this other artist that, that y'all are working with who has created a thing to get rid of the trash. And I started thinking about my vacuum to get rid of the stars. <laughs> um, and uh, it just, it struck me as, as you know, this odd thing, because in the middle of the, the that gallery where my work is, is that Trevor Paglin um, orbital scale sculpture or something. And uh, when that piece was announced, that it was going to, the, the, the version that was going to get launched up into outer space, like all these, scientists were pissed saying it was going to be just more trash out in space because it was useless. It didn't have a function. And I, I, I was like, oh, that's, a, that's kind of a good point. You know, I'm like, that's weird. And then I watched this interview with Paglin. He's like, he's like, 
why does art not have a function? Like its function is art. Like, and why, you know, why is this being challenged more than, you know, all the communication satellites and military satellites that go up there that, oh, those are serving us? Like, what are they serving? And I was like, oh yeah, good pro travel, right? Way to go, hit back, hit back. Um, you know, but then, then that piece presented this conundrum, the, 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 uh, the amount of money that went towards trying to get the, the satellite up into space, I mean, I think it was like a $20 million project funded by the Museum in Utah, and like, uh, and then in the end it just disappeared. Like, <laughs> like if you go on the, if you go on his website, there's a great press release talking about how it's still a success, even though like, they were never able to track it or see it or you know who knows what happened to it and like it literally probably did just become a piece of trash because it it's a broken sculpture just like all the broken satellites up there but you know even on top of that like rocket fuel to get it up there um, you know the infrastructure and all the money that goes to SpaceX and where all that stuff comes from um, it just leaves me with these questions and maybe this is again why I turned to to, to lo-fi stuff maybe I am getting around this answer this question of like stuff that I can do that is not resource intensive. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, as awesome as that project was, it, it was just so resource intensive, like across the board. And um, maybe as much as I, I distrust like spectacle that I don't understand how it was made or not showing it, I distrust stuff that's resource intensive. How are we on time? Do we have a little time still? Um, yeah, we'll take one more. Okay. So uh, could you talk a little then, um, I want, definitely want to give time for questions, but can you talk a little bit about how the work here, which you point out, spans a period of time, how that might relate to projects you're working on now or projects that you might want to undertake in the future? Hmm. I feel like it, looking at that work and over the course of it, um, somebody's ever reminded something somebody a professor said to me in grad school one of the same professors who hated everything that we were doing and he said like, one of the things I hate about art by young people is it's always about themselves <laughs> I was like that's just because you're old and boring um, but uh, and when I think about the, the it might look good this way too there's like an insistence on like I'm doing this which relates to the idea of like it wanting to be lo-fi and stuff, and even the inclusion of my hands. You know, they're, they're like, this is my gesture. And then moving that towards the color space rocks, and as much as there is a secret picture that's a self-portrait as a rock, um, like those were so much, like, like I feel like I've removed my literal self from it in so many ways, and they're about, the history of a medium. They're about a con the construction of an imagery, a, a specific image, but also the construction of fantastical imagery, and like an analysis beyond uh, sort of my own opinion or my own, my own taste. And since the color space rocks, I, I feel my, my work has gotten really um, austere and abstract. Um, and, it, it, and some of it is really about like trying to break down like art into super basic visual elements, just like lines and shapes. Um, but the majority of what I've been doing the past couple of years has just been like black pen on paper. Um, and I make these really frenetic stop motion animations. You can find them on my Instagram, um, along with pictures of my dog. And, uh, uh, and, but it, it's, it's, you know, thinking like even, so if, that, if those pieces, among other things, were about how, how a color photograph is constructed in a way, these are just like bond, like what's a line? What can a line do on a piece of paper? And it's not I mean, groundbreaking and stuff people have been you know, investigating for 120 years, but it's just what I'm trying to figure out. And again, it's like really, really basic. That use of your hand in that video, hands in that video, it also strikes me as bearing a relationship to some of the early critiques of photography as an art form where what was ostensibly lost was the so-called hand of the artist mm -hmm. that um, that so much of what people have responded to over centuries was the their at least um, their sense that 
there was a something being communicated um, through, let's say, the painted space or the sculpted space because the artist's hand touched it. Mm -hmm. And that photographically, or today we might say in lens-based media or digital media, that is where, where you don't have material substance, where what you have is um, immaterial or light trace or something of that nature, um, that one of the early critiques of photography was simply that you don't have that, that piece of the, the artist communication. Um, so in bringing the hand back in that low-tech way, um, I mean, I wonder if there is some thinking about lens-based media, media as a kind, as as an artistic tool, as um, a tool that is indebted to um, the body of the artist, the hand of the artist. Yeah, I, I think there's a ton of thinking about that, and I've often wondered myself if I'm making these drawings as a response to so. Yeah, this early critique of photography, you know, the hand of the artist is, and like that was part of the point, right? Like we, we mentioned, so that we don't have the, well, the time, the, the, the dexterity that you need, you know, you can create these images, like that was the mo part of the motivation of the invention. Um, and if you haven't picked up from some of the anecdotes I've told, I'm kind of a, like, reactionary against, like, what you're supposed to do, or, like, like trends and stuff, I'll, I'll try to buck them. And, uh, I think the drawings, they came about in many ways, but one of the things is thinking about this like return to analog photography that has become so popular in the past five or 10 years. And when I talk to people about a lot of them, you know I mean? Like, like I just want to do something with my hands and touch. And I'm like, that's a lot of shit, you know? <laughs> like, like you're not. This is a medium that is about divorcing your hand from it. And just because you're getting your hands in some really toxic chemical, um, doesn't mean you're doing something with your hands. This is a product of industry still. This is a product of science. And, um, and, and so, like, I think it, part of it, my drawing was like, like, you want to go analog? I'll show you analog. Here's <laughs> pencil on paper. Like, that's really doing something with your hands. It's not, you know, like, just, you know, harkening back to this, this uh, you know, really a, a industrial and corporate fiction of some kind of craft. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so so thinking back, like how could I do something even more more manual? Um, you know, dealing with that, like, I think the, the the analog trend, but I would say, say even started 15 years ago, like this resurgence of photograms. Like the photogram was a big thing. I saw some show at Cali and I don't remember the name of the artist, but like literally his photogram, like his his work was like burns in canvases and paper that he did with magnifying glasses. And I remember, I was like, this is a real photogram, <laughs> like not even using photosensitive material, like using the magnifying glass to make the mark. It's really wild. So I wonder if we might open it up to any questions. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of sort of probably argumentative things. So uh, 1839, uh, February 14th, Jacques Daguerre announced photography at a joint session of the Academy of Science and Art. So it was always connected together. So number one point. The number two point about using your hands, analog versus uh, digital. My quick response to that is digital is a TV dinner and analog is a well-cooked meal uh, because the hand does make a difference when you're making a print in a dark room. Um, and if you haven't done it, I'm not sure you have a lot of experience in the dark room, but it is a tremendous difference. Uh, so that's my view of it, uh, coming from a photography background and making photographs for many years. Um, but I think some of the things you said about the shift in photography, I'd be curious how you teach all the different facets of photography, because you have personal photographs, you have commercial photographs, yes, scientific, yes, art photographs, but it's such a fluid medium uh, I mean, how do you talk about it? Because, as you said, in the physics department, they teach it, mm -hmm. and they teach how it works. And you said, you know, well, it's kind of the same, but how do you explain that? Because I think that's a real difficult thing, because 
it can be so many things, and as you said with Egerton, at one point it is scientific work, but the context in which it's shown makes it artwork, because he always said it wasn't an artist. So how do you talk about photography in these different sort of realms? Um, well, first I want to address, I, I do have a lot of darker experience. Um, okay. Like I, I started doing work in a dark room when I was 12. I, uh, I worked in the, at the Chicago Historical Society printing archival negatives for a couple of years. Um, I worked in, in San Francisco doing both darkroom printing and digital printing for a number of artists. I worked in LA printing for a number of people who were big there, both darkroom and, and digital stuff. And, and I think a darkroom print can be a TV dinner too, um, the way it's followed. And, and, uh, I, I think that, like, if you learn the technique of it, and you can learn it really by the numbers, it's still, you know, something that if you follow the instructions, you know, keep good records of what you're doing, you can go make a print that matches the print you made before. Like, if you had recorded everything down to the temperature of the chemistry, you know, it's going to match it because it's rational. Like that. And that, um, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot about why there's a richness with the darkroom experience is like, well, there's accidents, you can't repeat it. And I was like, well, if you're doing it right, you can repeat it, and that was always the point. And you know, it's easy to not use a computer the right way, also, and like get these accidents to happen and stuff like that. And so, like I, I, I think both of them can be TV dinners, and both of them can be slow cooked meals, depending on how you're using the medium. And I actually think it's exciting to use photography as a TV dinner. I think a lot of the artists I look up to embrace the medium because of it being like a TV dinner. But I hope you realize I preface it by saying argumentative. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's good. I like, that. <laughs> like that made me think but, for a moment about it. But again, like um, where it goes. And so, but, but then, 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 how do you how do you talk about it in all these different contexts? And so, and um, and like that's that's one of the exciting and really hard things to talk about with photography about what is the difference, you know, between the snapshots you're making all the time now. Like we all. I'm guessing we all have cameras in our pockets, which I think is really exciting and, and fun, but like, is there a difference between that snapshot and something you're doing for art class or something you're doing for physics class? And then when the stuff slips in between, you know, like, you know, there's a long history of the snapshot slipping into art, there's a long history of the science slipping into art. Like, that's that exciting moment. And, you know, I focus on context and that, like, like, you could just be showing your snapshots. You know, in this, you could bring your science stuff, but you need to develop different language to talk about it. Um, and then, you know, the, the the side part that gets tricky is like, then you have a student who might be, well, why should I learn how to do this technically correct or, or something? And, and I'm like, well, because you might want to change how it looks or get it to evolve, get your evolved look, or even just learning that technical side of it is going to make you think of different things. And so, like what got me to thinking about these white rocks and the, like how it's constructed and it is like an understanding of how the medium works on a technical side. I mean, it's a historical understanding, but like, like that inspired me to go and do this thing. And so I try to like, I try to teach it in a way that, that everything comes in and that there's a big understanding of developing a language that understands the history and the context of an image um, and how, how that context is fluid and what can change. But the other thing that's really interesting is how different sort of segments of photography influence other segments of photography. Because if you think about uh, photojournalism today, that's called photojournalism, how it was influenced in the 60s, 70s by art photography. And so the, the sort of typical grip and grin photograph of the newspaper was sort of changed to have a quote, quote, more arty look. Yeah. You know? And so it's interesting how those things change or how the sort of uh, vernacular photograph uh, has influenced fashion photography. Yeah. So that's what's also how photography is influencing various types of photography. Yeah. And then also then how photography influences, quote, art. Right. And stuff like that. Right. And in that, like, from a pedagogical standpoint, it gets interesting then because you have a you know student who wants to do this one thing, and like the, the initial thought might be to copy what's already out there. And like when I taught at art school, I would often get 
photo students wanting to be fashion photographers and to, trying to explain to them the interesting things that happen in fashion photography is when you're making something that doesn't look like fashion photography and more than and I don't know anything about fashion or, or, or fashion photography that's not an area I'm an expert in but my general feeling of just having like a slight awareness is like like that's an industry that's looking for something to change and new really quickly um, and so that if I if I teach you fashion photography it's not going to be what gets you to be a fashion photographer as you go out and that like finding some some kind of look or thing that you do that then can be used by that industry is what's going to do it but but doesn't look like what they're already doing Thank you. um so it seems to me that um both in terms of subject matter um and certainly personally um but then also technologically there's a sense of nostalgia to some of the thing, the, some of the works you've been talking about today. Um, this looking back and um, just thinking about photography also as a tool for for n nostalgia and remembering. Could you could you talk about that? Do you see that as part of your work, or is that sort of behind some of the things, the choices that you're making? I don't know. To, like, like, what kind of nostalgia? Like, well, like I, a, for I a medium mean, or for a, a moment? Well, yeah. Like, I mean, culturally, like thinking about nostalgia for the like space, the the space race, and and I think which a lot of you know the Star Wars movies mm -hmm. kind of brought up, um, and and then you know the eighties. I don't I don't know. Thinking about pop, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, kind of popularly there. Right. Um, but then certainly like hearing you talk about well, but, you know, back in grad school, I remember this, and I you know, and pulling or that documentary you remember as a child and. Um, pulling that into what you're doing yeah. much later. I don't consciously think about it. Um, I remember being like in a review once or something of my work. It it was described as like having an understanding of like that the sublime is gone um, and that transcendence isn't really possible still. But I'm still I'm, at, I'm like kicking around the ashes looking for it. Like I'm, I'm sort of trying to excavate the ruins and find it still. I don't know if I completely agree that I don't feel that I feel as the sublime is gone or transcendence is not possible. Like I think, from my point of view, I was making an argument it is possible and it is still there. It's just maybe a different way to get to it. Um, but this person was saying that it, like there, there was a cynicism of what I'm doing, um, but that I was still searching. And it was like, does that kind of address like it's a little way like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess you could think about nostalgia searching for the past. And yeah, well, but searching for a feeling that something could be incredible or right. was incredible right, right. or something like that. Um, I think my, my reliance on, like, these anecdotes, I've never thought of them as nostalgia so much as just figuring out how I got here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really want to go back to any of those moments. Um, and I don't remember them as wonderful or anything. I'm just trying to figure out, like, like how but my worldview was formed. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Um, this is going back like almost four years ago, but I took a black and white photography course, so I was in a dark room, and what you were saying about manip manip manipulating by hand. We use terms like burning and dodging mm -hmm. um, so we could manipulate how our photo looked. And um, this just brought back a, a memory from the past nostalgia. So um, with the, and that was with film, so with digital cameras, how is that different in the dark room as far as developing your pictures and how they turn out versus using film from the past? Do you mean specifically burning and dodging, or, or is it just the whole, yeah the whole process? Because I I would be able to with the film make my picture you know manipulate my picture however I wanted. So can you do the same exact? No. <laughs> the computers allow you to do it better. Uh, so while the darkroom part is fun with your hands. A lot of the stuff that you would do with the burning and dodging is tedious and silly when you have a computer that you can do it perfectly. You know, the thing, yeah, the thing that I was talking about, the hands though, is 
there is an enjoyment factor of actually being a part of it, you know. And that my my analogy was you don't really enjoy cooking a TV dinner, you just cook it, you know, you know, when you make a dinner. But but all the things that you need to do that sort of fine tune a photograph are done much, much better by a computer. You know, you can take old negatives and scan them, but then you're gonna manipulate them on the computer screen with Photoshop. So I mean, like in the way it's talked about, I wouldn't say it's done by the computer. It's done with the computer yeah, exactly. um, because, like, the computer's not doing it through. I mean, maybe now it can through some kind of AI moment where it knows where to do the thing. Um, but my understanding, like, it's still like you're going and making choices. You're you're working with it, and I think this idea of like the, the enjoyment comes to things that you're like what you're used to. And um, I remember I you know when I used to teach film photography, you know, there, there'd be talk about. It the magic of that first moment when you're in the dark room and the print emerges from the chemistry. You know, and um, in my, my experience, the world like that had become something so familiar and programmatic almost because I had to know exactly, you know, like when I worked the historical society, we had to record like what, you know, this, this plate, what, you know, how did we print this? Because somebody's gonna want another print of it, we have to print it exactly the same. It's not magic anymore, it's, it's science or something. And, um, the first time I saw an inkjet print get made, like you know, this picture on a computer screen, and this machine, it goes, zzz, zzz, zzz. I was like, what is happening? Like, it blew my mind. I was just amazed that like, this, it, like ink was being thrown down to, you know, as this thing goes back and forth. And I still, like it comes, like I have a 60 inch printer and I make these big prints of my work and you know, it comes out and it's just, it's amazing to me when it comes out and then it comes out right. And that like, this thing happened, that, it fills me with the same kind of joy that a lot of people I you know, get out of working like with the dark room and analog photography or something that it's like there's a way to find I mean it's a craft that we're talking about either way and, and both of them can be done you know the, the, the person working at the, the old school photo printer at, at Walgreens or CVS or you know whatever I don't think it was taking the joy and the craft of printing but you know somebody else could be in there and the same thing with the inkjet printing you know like there's somebody out there just hitting the button and there's other moments where you're like oh if i tweak this if i do this you know, it's going to do these things that um, have that same kind of craft involved well, i'd like to thank you for coming flying here on the red eye and, <laughs> and being such a trooper all day yeah. and i'm sure that if anybody has questions that they want to ask you individually that you're open to that yeah, yeah. so thank you so much yeah. for coming thank if you, you haven't thank seen you. the show it comes down this weekend so take a look at it now while you can um and and thank you both for, for bringing it to us as well thank you.